just stay home. That is a good day to be in church. Amen. Amen. Well, let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness to us. You have been so faithful. We are so grateful. Lord, we just today want to worship you. We want to honor you. This is the reason why we worship and we sing and we praise is because you are the focus of our service, not us, not what we're going to get out of this thing. It's you that we have come here to pay attention to. It's you here, you that we've come here to celebrate, to adore, and to worship. And so, Lord, we just want you to be lifted up today in every way possible for you to have your way. Lord, we pray that you'll prepare our hearts to hear what you want us to hear from you today and to receive your word into our spirit. I pray for any distractions, whether they be within this building or with their own mind or with their own bodies. I pray that all distractions be gone in Jesus' name, that we may be able to clearly hear your voice. I pray, Lord, as we come into this service, even those that are on their way, it'll be almost like we're dialing in the radio to the right station, and we have a clear signal to hear you today. But before anything, Lord, we just want to worship you. You're awesome. You are worthy to be praised. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. something to look forward to, don't we, y'all? This is not our home forever. This is not our home forever. We've got a beautiful home waiting for us. And we got work to do. we got other people that need to go home with us when the time comes. And they're hungry. There's people so hungry for the Word. So when you talk to people, remember what a beautiful name His name is. Speak things in Jesus' name.
somebody. I don't want to interrupt that spot. So if we could just give, give a couple more verses there. Let's let God do his work. church this beautiful Sunday morning with you know all the rain and everything we've had it's actually a really nice morning so I want to welcome everybody out with that um, we're going to go into our time of offering and uh, praying over our prayer requests before I do that I do want to put out one quick thing I know last week we had the sign up sheet for CPR if you are needing CPR especially if you're a teacher in the church I have the sign up sheet in the back Please get with me so we can get that signed up so we can get the classes started and going and everything on that. Uh, if you're a teacher here, the church is looking to go ahead and cover the cost of that. Um, if not, the deal that we're getting, I guarantee you're not going to get a cheaper CPR class. Okay. <laughs> so if you need it, see me. We have the list in the back. We did have several signed up. But um, I do want to go into our time of offering, though. Uh, and as we say every Sunday, we can give in the basket, we can give online, right? But it's all just a part of our continued worship to God. Um, this is an act of worship. 
Uh, sometimes this is really a act of faith because um, I know I've been there before. You know, we're writing that check. Sometimes I don't know, is this bill going to get paid if I pay this or not? You know, if I, if I give my tithe, am I going to meet my, my bills? But God has always been faithful. And I just encourage you, you know, if you're in that spot, I would challenge you. Take that step of faith. Give the, you know, give the, give the tithe, the offering, see, see what God does. Because, like I said, He is always faithful. And He will reward our servant's heart, our willingness to do what we're supposed to do for Him. So... We're going to go into our offering. We also have our prayer requests. Uh, if you have any of those, uh, we have little slips of paper. If anybody didn't have one, if you want to slip your hand up, Gary can get you one. Otherwise, we have them in the back. You can always write one down. We put them at the foot of the cross. We pray over them every single Sunday. And, you know, we know God has answered them. As soon as we put them down, we know that God has answered them. But... It's always good to pray over it because that's what we're supposed to do. That's our part in everything. So we'll go ahead and if you want to bow your heads, we'll go into our offering and prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time of offering that, Father, we can just give back a little bit of what it is that you've given to us. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord, for, for the blessings that you have given us, Lord, whether it's just personally or within this country, Lord God, because, Father, we, we do have an abundance, even though sometimes it does not seem so. But any way that it goes, Father, everything that there is is yours. So, Father, help us, Lord, to have that servant's heart and help us, Father, to just be able to have that loving heart to be able to give back just a little bit, Father in recognition for all that it is that you do for us. And Lord, just be a, a good steward and a good servant to you, Father. So Father, help us with that, Father, and we just pray that, Lord, your hand would be upon it and that, Father, it would just be used to your honor and your glory. And Father, we also pray for the prayer requests that are over here at the foot of the cross. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord, for the fact that you have already answered each and every one of them that's in here. Father, we may not know the answer, we may not like the answer right offhand, but Father, it's your perfect answer. So Father, we just pray that you just go with us, give us strength, give, give us knowledge and wisdom, Father, that we might understand and we might have peace with what the decision is. But Father, we just pray that you would touch each and every one of these, Father, and we just thank you and we praise you now for the fact that you have answered them. So we praise you, Lord God, now. Just go with us throughout the remainder of the service, Father. For in Jesus' name that we ask you. Amen. I guess we have graduation stuff. So we're going to have a graduation presentation led by Pastor Matthew. So if you would, give him a round of applause as he comes up here. All right. Good to see everybody this morning. Before we do that, I just want to have a couple of quick things I want to mention. Um, Terry has got a sign-up sheet on the back table there somewhere for Haven of Rest. I believe that was supposed to be our emphasis for June, and it was all, or May rather, and it's almost the end of May. So we're going to, I think, carry that into June. So uh, Haven of Rest is a great ministry in Bristol, the ministers of the homeless. Car Terry actually works there. So he's one of the cooks in the kitchen, does a great job. And so he knows what they need in the kitchen because he's in the kitchen. So there is a list of things there um, that I think it's about 10 items or so that are needed. So do um, uh, you want to just kind of pass that around a little bit, Terry? It seems to be the best way. If you've got a pen, you can pass with it. That'd be great. Uh, if anybody wants to go ahead and put down you know, something they want to bring really over the next, you know, three or four weeks. So next time you're going shopping, look for a deal on something, and you can bring something every week, or you can just wait and bring it, you know, three or four weeks' time, whatever's better for you. But uh, that'll help you to see what's needed, and um, we want to support uh, this great ministry. Also, um, next Sunday, and this is something that is probably all in my head, but the others on our leadership team seem to have been happy to go along with. Um, but, uh, you know, every Sunday we record our service, we put it out on Facebook and on YouTube so that those who are not here can be a part. And I think that is important to do. Um, however, 
um, I think it sometimes can be a bit restrictive because if you're up here preaching or if you have something you want to share, you have a testimony or something like that, sometimes it's hard to get out of your head that somebody in, in Zimbabwe could be listening to what you have to say, right? <laughs> Not that we have anything against Zimbabwe. We love Zimbabwe. Pray for God to move there. But you have no idea who may be hearing what you're saying. And that can be exciting um, because the audience is bigger than what's here on Sunday morning. We know that. Um, and But there are those that are not part of this church that watch, and we're glad that they do. We want to welcome them to be a part of our service. But there's part of me that just longs once in a while to just talk to the people that came those that are physically in the room that made it that were able to come and physically be here and there are things we can minister there's things we can share to one another knowing that it's just us that i think uh, can be very liberating so um, what we've decided to do and this next sunday is going to be a test run i would like to do this one sunday a month the last sunday of every month but this next Sunday will be the first one we'll try, and we'll see how it goes. We're going to have what I'm calling an offline service. So church will be just church as normal. Everything will be irregular, but we won't be putting the service out on YouTube or Facebook next Sunday. So I'll probably put out a short little, you know, you know, five or ten minute message um, along the line with what I'll be sharing next Sunday so those that don't make it can at least get something um, but um, aside from that that'll be it so what, what I would like to encourage you to do number one is be here so you get the service that's important brings as many people with you as you can um, but also be praying about is there something you'd like to share no pressure to do that. No one's going to push you or force you or twist your arm. But if there is something that's on your heart that you would like to share that maybe you wouldn't have felt comfortable doing if Zimbabwe was listening, right? Maybe you could do that next Sunday. So um, and what I would like for you to pray about, if you're feeling to do that, is to not just pray about something, you know, share about something great, good news, yay, God is good, that, that's good, that's always good. But maybe pray about something you struggled with. Maybe pray about sharing about something that has not been an easy thing for you to deal with in your life. And maybe even something you're walking through right now um, that you need people to pray with you about. And I would love to have that opportunity next Sunday to, to hear from just a couple of you maybe that, you know, what I've been preaching about the last three weeks is about being real, right? And, and, and I'll, and I'll kind of... I'll kind of key things, uh, set things off with that next week, reminding you how important it is that we be real with one another. And you can't, don't share things that you don't want the whole congregation to know. No deep, dark secrets. I'm not looking for that. Um, but just, just something that maybe that just shows you're human and that everything isn't perfect always in your world. Um, that would be wonderful, I think, to take that opportunity next year, next week to do that. So, um, so be praying about that. Again, no pressure. I'm not going to get here and number you all off one, two, one, two, one, two, and say all the ones go first, all the twos go next. Not going to do that. Um, if you don't feel you want to say anything, there's no pressure to do that. But I think there may be a few that will. And I, I just pray that God just does something in that that's a little different to what we would normally do on a Sunday. So, um, so please get the word out. Next Sunday is an offline service. Everything else will be as normal. But... Um, um, we'll just see what God does with that. Just, that's the way we used to do church, you know? That's the way everybody used to do church. And um, I remember years ago, we used to, we used to tape, get tape recordings of the services. Y'all remember that? Y'all been around a while? Remember that? And you had to track somebody down to get that? <laughs> And, and uh, then they had to, we had, a, we had a duplicator. We would run off like four, four or five copies at a time. But if you didn't have the tape, you couldn't listen to it. There's no other way. And things have changed, and I like that it's accessible. But sometimes it's just got good to go back to our roots. So uh, I'm looking forward to that next Sunday. So, uh, amen. There are, will be other announcements on the screen, but that one was coming right up, so I want to make sure you knew about it. All right. Um, I would like to ask... Uh, our graduates, and I know Talon wasn't able to be here, but we're going to mention him this morning. But I would like Franklin and Lance just to come and stand right here. And I'm not going to make you say anything publicly, but I do want to recognize you. So just, just kind of stand here and look out towards them. We'll see who the tallest is. That is not hard to do. So, uh, <laughs> so um, and also Talon. So their, their full names, this is Lance Kellel Thomas. 
So Superman in um, in uh, in another another world. Um, you are Superman. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. And Franklin McKinley Gullion. 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 Bested up already. Would you give them a big hand, both of them? <laughs> also, not able to be here this morning is Talon Charles Poe, and we're so proud of him. Um, would you give Talon a big hand as well? So um, that was the names. I do have some other things written, and I have a, a couple of presentations to give you. Um, before I do that, um, and I'm sorry, um, who else, who is graduating from elementary school going into middle school? Is there anybody? Bradley? Would you stand up real quick, just right where you are? Anybody else graduating from an elementary school to middle school? That's a big deal. It's a big shift. Would you give Bradley a big hand? Congratulations. Is there anybody that has finished college or got some kind of certification or degree this year? Anybody? All right. Didn't want to make sure we didn't miss anybody out. All right. So um, I want to give you all a presentation Bible. I have one for Talon as well. I'm not used to having to hold a mic and have one hand. And this one's talents. So when it comes to a Bible. Now this is something that um, we wanted to get you a Bible you could use as an adult. You're actually 18 now, so you're technically an adult already, right? Are you 18 yet? Almost though. You both graduated yesterday or Friday? Whenever it was this week. This, this week. So part of what one well, reason we recognize graduates is it really is it's a change from boyhood to manhood. Whether you're 18 or not, in many ways, you're adults. And you're asking God to guide you in the next part of your life. The best guide for your life is the Word of God. So what we presented you with here are nice Bibles. These are not, you know, something you get, you know, at the dollar store, two for a dollar. These are nice Bibles. This is a Bible you can continue to use. And inside this has some tools. Every Bible needs some good tools. the bottom of every page. You see all those verses? As you read through it, you'll see there's a link to those verses. And what that will do is link you to other verses in the Bible. One of the things that's difficult and daunting about the Bible is when you're reading one passage, you don't know how that connects to something else. That'll connect it for you as you go through. Also, it's not the biggest and most extensive, and you can Google stuff now, so you may not even use this. But there's a concordance in the back. So if there's a verse that you like, but you don't know where it's at. A lot of them are going to be in there alphabetically, just like a dictionary, and it'll take you to where those are, where those are. I like the way this one lays. It's good binding. This is a Bible you can hold in your hand, and it's comfortable. I encourage you to read the Word of God, study the Word of God. If you haven't read through any book of the Bible yet, start with the Book of John, and then just go through. And as you go through, as a verse pops out at you. Look at the reference in there and let it link you to something else. Uh, version Bible app. Do either one of you have that already? You need to check that out. version Bible app. Um, there's all kinds of Bible study plans on there, devotionals you can read, things that will help you, tools to study the Word of God. Um, this one's Talon's Bible. We'll give that one to him. And I want to read you a couple of verses and we'll pray over you. Um, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, and I wrote that in the front of each of your Bibles. Be diligent, or the King James says, study, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As you study the word, it will show you your path to life. I'm sure you're still making decisions about what you're going to do with your life. The word of God will help to guide you. The second part, towards the end of 2 Timothy, there's a verse, 2 Timothy 4, verse 13. It says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. 
And I love that verse because it's, the, it's the last, one of the last verses the Apostle Paul wrote. He's in prison at the end of his life, and he's still studying, still studying the Word of God. I, I meant to look it up. The statistic is, sta is staggering. After people graduate high school, very few ever read a full, full book again the rest of their life. They basically cease learning. Stop learning. Don't let that be you. Continue to learn. Learn in the Word of God. Learn in life. Whether you're going to college or trade school or whatever you're doing, don't just let it stop when you get your certification or your degree. Continue to learn for the rest of your life. And you'll be amazed what uh, God will guide you into. And this, that's this verse kind of ties in with that. For Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or finished, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything, uh, if, anyone think, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. I wrote down here, this is a completion of your childhood education and essentially your childhood. It's also a beginning. A beginning of being an adult and stepping out into the world to see who you will become and what you will do with the life God has given you. Don't settle. Press forward that you may lay a hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of you. Which means he has a plan for your life. You don't even know what that is yet. And that's okay. But the more that you continue to pursue Him, pursue His Word, continue to learn, God will show you. Amen. Can we stretch our hands towards these young men? I just want to pray for them. Lord, I thank you for Franklin. Thank you for Lance. I thank you also for Talon, who was not able to be here in person today. But every one of these, we honor these young men. Thank you, Lord, for their determination to finish. So many don't finish what they started. They finished graduated, they completed their childhood education. And Lord, they're stepping into manhood, adulthood, even before our eyes. We pray, oh God, that they will hunger for your word. They will seek your word. You will speak to them, that you will guide them and direct them in the decisions they make, the choices they make. They feel like they got a lot of time. I know they do. But time goes so fast. Guide them, Lord God, to decisions that are wise. I pray, oh God, you'll put in them a continued hunger to learn, to grow, both in your word and, and all things in our, in, our, in our world, to continue to grow in their minds. Lord, I pray, oh God, that you will just give them a direction that they need for the path that they take. We pray your blessing upon them today. We honor them today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Would you give these young men a big hand? Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, and here's your box. All right. Well, um, it is time to dismiss our kids to their classes. And they're already going. That's it. Go, go, go. Would you give our kids a big hand as they go to their classes today? We love them. I, I shared a video on the app this morning. I don't know if any of you, you saw it. But uh, having kids that are rambunctious and loud and noisy is a sign of life. And that's wonderful. Amen. So we'll serve. All right, well, uh, I am going to be quiet now, and I'm going to introduce to you someone you know well, and I'm so grateful for. Uh, Pastor Kevin is going to preach today. Today is Pentecost Sunday. That's a big Sunday in the church calendar, and it's not something you even, it's even, you know, marketed in Walmart, so you wouldn't even know about it unless you were a Christian. So I like this day because of that reason. Um, this is the day the church began. Pentecost Sunday back in the book of Acts, and I think you're going to hear a bit about that today. But I'm just so grateful for Pastor Kevin. Uh, thank you for giving me a, a breather today. I needed it. So would you, would you stand up, just all of you? I know he doesn't like this, but we should do it once in a while. 
I appreciate this man. I want to tell you, the last four Wednesdays, I have been on the road working. I've not even been here. I, him and Andy and others that lead our team and the youth and the kids have carried things for four weeks, and I've not even been here. And you did that for half of the year in 2021, the half of the year in 2022 as well. I'm so grateful for you. Would you give Pastor Kevin a big hand? I need to turn this on. All right, so today is a special day. <laughs> it's Pentecost Sunday, but it's also my wife's birthday. So, <laughs> birthday. birthday to you. Oh, I thought I would celebrate her birthday uh, this morning <laughs> by being pulled over by the police. And <laughs> so if you notice, we were late. That was my fault. Huh? Oh, yes. Yeah, I did. But I was like, my church, my church doesn't think that running stop signs is a sin. So <laughs> we're... we're we're, we're fine. <laughs> uh, he didn't agree. But, uh, he was polite. Uh, what was his name again? Aaron. <laughs> Aaron. He was a very, very uh, nice police officer. And, like, I have a history um, of being confrontational with police officers and uh, not like a good thing. And uh, the last time I had been pulled over, I got into a pretty confrontational exchange with the police officer that pulled me over. Not good. And uh, so this morning, it's totally different. And it was like, it was neat uh, because I just felt, you know, that God, God had, I had grown in, in, that, in that confrontational attitude I have sometimes. And, uh, it was just nice to see that naturally the Lord has done something in me and I've seen evidence of it this morning because, you know, I was, I was 100% representing this church this morning. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't know, but it's good. I, I didn't have a Calvary shirt on. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I don't have that on my car yet, so it's good. It's a good thing. Good thing. No, he was he was a very uh, really good good guy. No no issues. You know, I broke the law. He called me on it, and that's that. Um, but anyway, if you guys would turn to Acts chapter two, and we're gonna do a lot of scripture reading today, uh, but it's kind of exciting. Do you guys like reading the Bible? Yeah. Everybody likes the Bible. Yeah. Like learning. Yeah. Like going a couple of layers deep. When you, when you get into it, so that's what I like to do. Um, and I appreciate you guys uh, joining me in this this morning. So if we go to Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read uh, to verse 39. So it's a lot of verses, and I'm not a good reader. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had finally come, they were all with one accord in one place. And Terry likes to tell that joke of what... <laughs> I don't know how many times anybody's heard him tell that joke, but he says, what kind of car did they drive? <laughs> Does she? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good joke. It's solid. Uh, but they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then they appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, they were, and there were dwelling in the uh, Jerusalem Jews, devout men, 
read that again. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because every, everyone heard them speak in their own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and the parts of Lib Libya, uh, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues with wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. She loved the mockers. The people would just always got something to say. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose. And since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants I will pour out my uh, pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. And before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may uh, not be shaken. And therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. And more, moreover, my flesh also Will rest in hope. For you will not leave my souls in hate my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up uh, the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into, into the heavens, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assur assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, 
and you shall, be, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, blessing us with this beautiful day, Lord. I want to thank you for blessing me with a, a beautiful wife that, uh, that you allowed me to, to marry, Lord, and that uh, she puts up with me. And I just uh, thank you for giving her another you. Lord, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for uh, giving us a place that we can gather together uh, without fear and worship you and study your word and pray together. Lord, we are grateful. Lord, I ask your blessing over this study. Lord, I ask that you guide my words. Lord, I ask that you uh, help me uh, and to overcome my shortcomings as a speaker and a communicator. Lord, I ask that you keep me humble, that you hold me accountable for every word that I say. Lord, I ask that you help me to not misrepresent you in any way to anyone. Lord, I ask that you help us to focus on you this morning and anything that's distracting us or trying to take our attention, any thoughts that enter our mind. Lord, I ask that you help us to just reject them and, and only see you this morning. Lord, I just thank you. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we had a, an interesting event that took place about 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, I mean ascension. Uh, you have Jesus, uh, he's gone, the disciples are, are about and they're in this room and all of a sudden this rushing mighty wind, the rushing mighty wind, the rushing mighty wind come in, or the sound of it, and this tongues of fire um, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to imagine tongues of fire or what this looked like. Um, I tried to like look at artist renderings or something. Maybe they had some insights, but everybody just kind of doesn't really know what that looked like. Um, it's kind of a strange description, I think. You see tongues of fire coming in, and uh, it settled on them. It says that they spoke with uh, languages and that uh, the Spirit gave them utterance. And the neat thing is, is it didn't stay in the house. When God's Spirit fell, like it, it hit them first, and then it just went out. And, and there were devout men who worshiped God and, and were there for the festival. And they were from all over. And uh, they got excited so much that people were accusing them of being drunk. And saying, you know, they're drunk this early in the morning. Like, like we just turned into a party. And that wasn't uncommon for religious uh, festivals throughout the world, like the Romans and the Greek culture, you know, at their temples and stuff, they just, they would get drunk and party. And that was what they did. And they were kind of assuming these guys are just behaving like the Greeks. And it's kind of an insult in that way. But I thought it was neat when they, when everyone saw this, and they're experiencing it, and, and they're like, they must be drunk, and they, they're throwing out their opinions. So finally, um, somebody looked at Peter after his sermon, and they were like, what should we do? What should we do? And it's a question that I've asked. I remember being a young man, and I didn't really believe in God. And I witnessed my son born, uh, my first child, and when he was born, and I saw him come out uh, uh, being delivered, and his brow kind of like had this inquisitive, like what in the world is happening? Like he was trying to figure things out as a baby just out of nowhere. And I remember believing in God. And I remember my first thought was, uh, there is a God. I mean, my first thought when I saw my son was, there is a God. God's real. And then... You know, shortly after, one of the next few thoughts that hit my head through that, that chaos was, what do I do? You know, 
there is a God now. I realize there's a God. What does that mean? What, what do I do with that information? And uh, I think it's neat that they, they came up with that question. And Peter answers the question when they said, what should we do? In Acts 2, 37 and 38, he says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as I prayed over this and was studying it, I felt led to, to focus on this portion of, of the text and the three things that Peter mentioned. Number one was repent. Number two was be baptized. Number three was receive the Holy Spirit. So we'll go ahead and get started. Number one is repent. I think if there was one word the American church could benefit from understanding, it would be repent. I think that that is, uh, it's almost become a bad word. It was like through the 90s, you started noticing that the word hell, it was like people were afraid to say that in church anymore. Uh, even when they would read the text, it was almost like they would cringe when they got to the word to read it. And um, in the 2000s, though, I've noticed the word repent has almost been done away with in churches. Um, it's not a bad word. John the Baptist said it. My first a meeting of uh, of Tom C and Pastor Matthew was him acting out a a part at Easter in the Park, and he's running up dressed as John the Baptist, screaming, "Repent, repent!" And I'll never forget that image of that crazy man running up the hill. But repentance isn't a bad word. Uh, John the Baptist said it, but after John the Baptist was incarcerated. In Matthew, if you read through Matthew, you notice that as soon as John the Baptist was incarcerated and he wasn't preaching repentance anymore, it says that Jesus was preaching repentance and telling people to repent, to repent that the kingdom of heaven come. So repentance. Now I looked it up, and, and this is kind of the, the nerdy part of me. Uh, the Greek word for repentance is uh, Met, I'm going to try to say it, uh, metan oweo, metan oweo. That is the Greek word for uh, repentance, and it just means to change your mind, to change your mind. That's all that word means. When Jesus is saying repent, it says change your mind. But there's also a Hebrew word for uh, repent, and that's uh, teshubah. And teshubah means turning back to God. So when you put those two together, you get a uh, change in your mind to turn back to God. You put them back together, you kind of get the idea of repentance. It's, uh, I've been doing things the way I want to do them. I've been doing things that I thought was right by my own mind, but I'm going to change that. I'm changing my mind, and I'm going to start doing the things the way God wants me to do. I'm going to behave in a way that God wants me to behave. And uh, turning back to God is just that 180 turn that you make. You're running to sin and away from God, and you just decide to run away from sin and to God. And that's really all uh, Teshubah means. Second Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And Joel 2, 12 through 13 says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. So God desires for us to turn to him, but um, 
turning to him with your whole heart, not partially. And uh, your heart is that place inside of you. It's this place where your carnal, your physical self meets your spiritual self. That place where they meet, that is your heart. And he says that he wants all of that. So, to turn away from sin, uh, I guess that adds, that adds another question. Like, what is sin? I guess that's another word that doesn't get mentioned much anymore in the American church. Sin uh, means to miss the mark, right? If you're aiming at something, you miss it. But really, Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he said to love your neighbor as yourself. Sin and turning from sin is turning away from anything that would not be that. If anything you're doing is not loving God with all your heart or not loving your neighbor, that is what you're supposed to turn from. So if you have a question of, well, what can I, what, what is sin? There's a good place to start. So repentance is kind of funny. Um, because it's something that we can do or think we're doing or say we're doing, um, but it's nice to have fruit to go with the repentance. Um, I remember hearing uh, a story of a man who had been ripped off for several thousand dollars by another person, and he was a, a pastor. And then this man calls him one day on the phone. He hadn't heard from him. The guy got away with all his money, and the guy tells him that he has become a Christian now. He says, I've found the Lord. I am so sorry. I have repented of my sin, and I, I just want to ask you for your forgiveness, and uh, I've repented of, of the sin, and you know, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus now. And the pastor said, well, that's really well and good, but I would really like to see some fruit in this repentance, and you give me my money back. And... Uh, so that's always a, a good thing. So we'll move on. Two, baptize. Uh, and that comes from a word called a baptizo, or baptizo, and it just means to be immersed. But uh, anyway, he says, uh, in verse 38, after he says, repent, he says, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of your sins. So we know baptized means to be immersed, but that word for, I thought was neat. When you, when you look into it, it's es, es, I can't pronounce it probably, but it's E-I-S. And that word means to be identified with. So that little word for, in English, when you take it to Greek, it, it means to be identified with. So to be baptized so that you can be identified with Jesus for the remission of your sin. And I, I think it's, it's kind of crazy. There's, there's no such thing as remission of sins without Jesus. No such thing. We can try to be better. We can recognize that we're a bad person. Right? We can hurt enough people and hit rock bottom and say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to quit this thing I'm doing. I'm going to clean up my act and try to live the straight and narrow. And that is good that you have turned from your sin. Right? You've turned from it. But, but it doesn't stop it. And, and as the, the good person test says, is if you told one lie, what are you? Liar. Does it does it matter like how much time goes by? Twenty years from now, does that mean you're not a liar? It only takes one one time. If, if like case in points, if you murder somebody, you're a murderer, right? One person. I murdered one person. I'm a murderer. I did it. Like say I, say you did it when you were 18. It's only one person, one time. But 50 years down the road, you're still a murderer. It doesn't matter that you didn't do it again. 
and it still stays. That sin stays. There's no remission without Jesus. See, the Old Testament, in, in the ancient world, they had these rituals where they would uh, sacrifice animals and that the blood would pour. But see, that didn't, that didn't do away with the sin. That just covered it. And then they had this other ritual where they would take a scapegoat and they would transfer sin from themselves. Like they committed a sin, so they would try to like have a priest lay his hand on the scapegoat, send it off. And they've transferred sin as, as their thought process, but that sin was still there. It did not get removed. I read a book one time uh, called The Sin Eater. Has anybody ever read that book, The Last Sin Eater? It's uh, by Francine Rivers. It takes place in this area with like Welsh people that have migrated here up in the mountains. And in the book, there's this 10-year-old little girl who had accidentally caused the death of her little brother. And she just thought her mom had went into depression. She thought that she had, she just hated herself and thought that what she had done was so bad that she could never be forgiven for it. And uh, this Welsh community, what they had was when somebody was coming to death, like gonna die, they had established one person in the village to be a sin eater. And this was an actual practice that, that was there with these communities. And the sin eater would live away from the village and have a completely lonely life he, wasn't, he didn't choose to be that. They chose him by casting lots, and then he was set off. And whenever a person was about to die, the sin eater would come, and all the sin of that person would be transferred to this one man who had to carry the burden of being a... And this is what this ritual that they believed, that they could pass it on. In the story, the little girl uh, meets this Christian. She's out in the, in the woods on the mountainside, and she meets this Christian missionary. He comes and he's trying to bring the gospel to this community, this, this village. And he gets the opportunity to share Jesus with her. He tells her that she can be forgiven. So for all the, the evil that she, you know, she thinks she had done for that sin, and he's like, you don't have to live with that. So she gets baptized in this story. And shortly after, the village people come and murder this man and beat him to death. So he only got to witness to one little girl, but through the story, she leads the entire village and the sin eater to Jesus. It's a really cool story. I recommend that book. And I guess I say that to mean that there's no such thing as remission of sins without Jesus. So we can go to church all we want. We can read our Bibles all we want. We can check all the boxes of good deeds and good behavior. I can be as polite as I want to to a lot of police officers that pull me over for running stop signs. But none of that matters without the remission of sin. And that doesn't happen without Jesus. So when he says to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. So if you've ever noticed the way we do baptisms at our church, we will take you down to a river. We fully dunk you underwater. Uh, we let you up pretty quickly. Uh, I've only had one kid that I held under too long. And uh, it's a joke. But I like to tell that to kids when I baptize them. <laughs> Don't worry, I've only had one kid die when I do this. Uh, but we, we do that. We dunk them underwater. We do that in Jesus' name. Have you ever noticed that? Some people will take and they'll say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. And some people say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some people will dunk you three times. They're like, I baptize you in the name of the Father. You, you ever seen that? The name of the Son. The name of the Holy Spirit. Like, the people that are afraid of going underwater, that's a lot. Some people, though, some churches, they baptize with like pouring water over people's heads. You ever notice that? Anybody ever witness that? Like they'll sprinkle water, some like kind of flick, trickle water, flick it, uh, different things. And it, it was a very confusing thing for me when I was a Christian. Uh, when I became a Christian, I, I, I was curious about baptism. And I had people that were from Presbyterian churches 
telling me that I had to do it this way. And I had people telling me that I had to sprinkle water on the head. And then I had other people telling me that, uh, I think it was the Presbyterian minister was the one that told me that, you know, you should baptize the babies. And then a Methodist minister was like, you need to sprinkle water on your head or whatever. He was describing it to me. And then, of course, you know, I had the, like, the Bluegrass Gospel Church I was going to, and they were like, no, you go to a river, and we dunk you in the water. And uh, it was confusing. And um, when I got baptized, I had people saying I'd done it wrong because, you know, I went to a river and got dunked under. And there were Christians that were confused about that. And I remember asking John Chapman years ago about baptism. And I, I, I was just curious, like, why, what is this? Is that wrong? Is that sinful for them? Is that, is that like her heresy that they are doing baptism this way? And uh, I remember he said, he's like, no, we duck people underwater. That's the way we like to do it. He said, we dunk people underwater. We believe that's biblical. And we do it in the name of Jesus. And he said, but he told me a story. He said, one time there was a lady who was dying of cancer. And she wanted to be baptized. But she was, they could not take this woman and dump out of that bed to a place to submerge her in water. Because she would, she was too frail, she would have died in the process. But she wanted to be baptized. So he said that what he did was he took water and baptized her in the name of Jesus, pouring water over her head gently and baptized her. And he said, that's not normally the way I do it. He said, but here's the problem with most people. And, and I thought it was just brilliant what he said. He said, he said, we should never focus on the words being said or on how it's done, but the focus should always be on the heart of the person being baptized. And I thought, what wisdom that man had. I was like, all those questions I had answered right there in that moment. Uh, we should always focus on that. So Romans 6, 1 through 5. says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So, when we have baptisms, we go down to the river, we kind of make a nice outdoor service of it, and then we have food, like a little cookout afterwards. And it happens a lot with baptisms. Uh, they'll have like a picnic or something with baptisms, usually singing, joy. Um, but right now in the world, there's a... There's, uh, countries that exist where if a person is baptized and identifies themselves as a follower of Jesus their life expectancy is about two weeks so when they're making that decision to be baptized in the name of Jesus they know that they will probably there's a likely that they will be dead in two weeks. Their house will probably get burned down. Bad things are going to happen to them because they've publicly identified as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. And we, we can read about baptism in the Bible and we put our Western world lenses in front of us as we're reading the scriptures and we start reading about baptism and we get an image in our mind of what we're doing. Because we live in this peaceful country that we can go baptize and go have food afterwards and nothing changes. Like we go to work, tell somebody we got baptized, there's usually going to be somebody giving you a high five. But see, to these believers here, right, when these people got baptized, their life changed. 
it, it was detrimental. Like when you did that in the Jewish community, the, the, the Jewish people that did not follow Jesus, like they wouldn't work with you anymore. They wouldn't uh, do business with you. If you had a business, they're going to skip you and go to somebody else because they're not doing business with you anymore. Your business is going down. Uh, if your parents weren't followers of Jesus, they would have to shun you like the Amish do, and you wouldn't be allowed to enter their house to share a meal with them, or they would be shunned too. And that's what baptism is. And see, to us, it's kind of in America, and I'm grateful it has lost its meaning in some ways. Like, like I had to ask, like, what is baptism? Like, and, and being identified with Jesus doesn't put you in danger. But to these people, it did. There are dangerous baptisms. So verse 3, and I'll, I'll try to move quicker. we got about five minutes. So verse 3, uh, receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Um, Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dis dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So do not be under the influence of wine, but be under the influence of the Spirit. And when you think of being filled with the Spirit, um, the imagery is, is not like a bucket being filled with liquid. The imagery is like a sail on a boat being filled with wind. So the imagery is power. Be powered by the Holy Spirit. It says everybody had heard uh, each other in their own language. So if you will turn to Genesis chapter 11. Verse 1. So we go back towards the beginning and it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And, they, and then they said to one another, Come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And then they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come let us go down and go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the, all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad from over the face of the earth. So we see, we can back up and look and see where God confused the languages. And then we see on the day of Pentecost that when the Holy Spirit fell and came upon these people, that the confused language thing that had happened there where God had separated them and confused their languages now all of a sudden they're all hearing themselves speaking in their own languages it's like one person speaking you know one language and it's several languages and then they're all hearing the same words and it's like this piece of, of this Old Testament story of the Tower of Babel this curse that kind of fell upon these people uh, the Holy Spirit repaired it and it was like Jesus had had fixed this, but, but there is a difference. It was like, if you notice now, um, when you go into churches, or if you even look at the disciples, the types of people that they were, like you had rebels, you had tax collectors, you had fishermen, 
Uh, you had highly educated people, but you, basically the rebels were like terrorists. And they, were, the tax collectors and rebels were, would be trying to kill each other, but yet under Jesus they were fellowshipping and getting along. And it was like this, this thing, and you go to churches and you see people. Like one thing that I noticed, I never had an old friend that was older than me. And then once I become a believer, I developed several deep friendships with men that were, I mean, I was 20 years old and I had a, a man in his 70s. I was close friends with him because of Jesus. Like the Holy Spirit broke down those communication barriers. And, and maybe you're not going to hear somebody who's speaking French and you understand it in English. Maybe you will. That has happened to people that, I, that I've read about. But when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're able to bridge that communication gap, that, that differences that people have. I went to a recovery meeting one time, and in the meeting you had people that were just almost looked homeless, you know, and tattooed up and just, they've had a rough time. And, and beside of them, in the chairs you had doctors, Lawyers, businessmen, bikers, young and old, and the Holy Spirit is what connects us all together. And without the Holy Spirit, there will be confusion amongst us. If you ever catch yourself where there's somebody in the church that just irks you, so other Christian just irks you, I don't know. Maybe uh, just check in there and see if your tank is full. So Galatians 3, 28 to 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are one, are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then... Are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise? You see, a church in agreement to serve the purposes of God, and they're powered by the Holy Spirit, can achieve anything that they propose. Just like the people at the Tower of Babel they said, they're all, in, they're all in agreement together, they're all speaking the same language. There's no communication barriers. There's, they could do anything that they propose to see what they, they were wanting to, to push their agenda. God stopped it. But when the Holy Spirit comes, we come together wanting to serve His purposes, powered by the Holy Spirit. There's not much that the church can accomplish. So, in conclusion... We'll go back to Acts chapter 10. I don't know if you've ever felt like you were left out or like you just don't feel like part of the group. You know, maybe you wanted to be part of a group and they just rejected you. You weren't picked to be in it for whatever reason. Uh, you know, maybe you're like I was, and you you kind of ran into Jesus. All of a sudden, you wasn't planning on it, and you wasn't raised in church, and you don't know how to act. You don't know the language that Christians speak. You walk into a church and wonder, what am I supposed to wear? Because you just don't know. What can I, what music can I listen to? Like, what's appropriate behavior as a Christian? And, and you don't know, but then you see other people that know what to do. You see, there was the day of Pentecost, but seven years later, there was a different Pentecost that happened. A different event. Very similar to this one. You see, Peter, uh, 
you know, had been living with the power of the Holy Spirit for a few years. And he gets a vision, and, he, and this man Cornelius is this Gentile guy, and he's a good man, and he's desiring to know God. And through these visions, they're linked up, and they go visit each other. And then Peter, being impressed with these guys, he, like, delivers a sermon to them, just similar to how he did on Pentecost. He delivers a sermon to these guys. And uh, verse 44, and these are unchurched people that don't know that don't know how to be Christians. They don't know how to follow Jesus, and they don't know what's appropriate behavior. And, and they're just... But they know that they want to know God. In verse 44 it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stay for a few days. You see, sometimes we can get really tied up in, in the rituals and, and what we're supposed to wear, what we're supposed to act like. Um, are we, uh, you know, the language that people use? Um, if you've ever met like a Christian and you're like, hey, we're fellowshipping, we're, it's great, this guy loves the Lord, and then he drops the F-bomb on you, and you're like, okay, I'm not used to it. But, but, it's just a work in progress. So the Holy Spirit, it's not my job to judge the person. It's the Holy Spirit. Is When they receive the Holy Spirit, it'll be power. If, if you have ever felt like you're left out and you don't know, and you're like, maybe I'm not as good as these other Christians. You know, like these guys got it all together. They know what to do. I feel kind of like a reject. You're in good company, for one. But also... It's all about the Holy Spirit, guys. And, and you just do what Peter said. You repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for remission of your sins, and receive the Holy Spirit and let Him power you. All right, guys, uh, that's all I got. If the worship team wants to come up, I'm going to close out because I took you all over about five minutes longer than I meant to. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your uh, for this wonderful day, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for uh, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you empower us to be able to serve your purposes, Lord. God, I just ask that you help us to uh, follow you Lord, in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, as they lead us in a song, I just want to just remind you this altar is open and this would be a great Sunday for you just to come and repent. Amen. Turn from something and turn towards God. Um, we, if you need the Holy Spirit, if you've never spoken in tongues and you desire that gift, we believe in that here. This would be a great Sunday to receive that gift as well. If you just want more of God, you just know you need to turn to Him and you need to be digging deeper in your walk with God, and you just want to take a moment. This is an opportunity right now. Um, so as they sing, this altar's open, or you can pray where you are as well. We won't hold you much longer. But respond to the Word. It's so important when God speaks. If God has spoken to your heart today, in some way it's important that we respond. Amen.
that they went to in the book of Genesis where the Tower of Babel was, Shinar. It also means that root word in Hebrew means to split or break through. On the day of Pentecost, there was a breakthrough. And if you push in and you just follow the, the directions that Kevin laid out this morning, repent, deal with the sin in your life, get baptized, Ask the Holy Spirit to come in and feel you. That breakthrough takes place in your life. Great word. Great word. Lord, I just thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for breakthrough in our life. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are the only way. And when we turn to you and we repent and we ask you to feel us, Lord, you do. Lord, we just thank you. We give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Y'all have an awesome afternoon. Love y'all. Marinette.